So the markets are racing a pretty nice gain at the start of trading once the uh, ISM came in. Uh, ISM manufacturing numbers came in lower than expected. The closely watched gauge of U.S. manufacturing and factory order, uh, factory activity falling to 47.8. Just know that uh, in September, that's the lowest reading since June of 2009. It also marks the second straight month of contraction in the manufacturing sector. President Trump responding with a tweet uh, calling out the Fed uh, yet again, this time calling them, quote, pathetic. I'm going to bring in Jack Ablin of Crescent Wealth Management, along with uh, the Bonson Group CIO, David Bonson. President Trump immediately tweeting out uh, to Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve. Uh, and and I, just, I just want to kind of add to that in the sense that Charles Evans, who's the president of the Chicago Fed, folks, the Chicago Fed, it, it covers the key states in the Midwest, uh, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Wisconsin. You've got 33 manufacturing plants that are closed in nine states, 22 distribution warehouses that are closed. He wants the Fed to stop uh, lowering rates. He wants to take it higher. And I do feel like that, you know, that they don't get all the blame, but they're certainly disconnected. This is in his backyard. And one of the key reasons this number is down. Well, Charles, I want really badly to agree with you, but I don't think that anyone can say the Fed has the cost of money too high relative to what it needs to operate this economy. There's an awful lot of octane in the economy, and President Trump's done a really good job of communicating how strong the economy is. Uh, the slowdown in manufacturing cannot be considered related to money being too tight. Credit is flowing. Credit spreads, as you know, Charles, are very tight. The reality is that this is trade war related and we have to get through the other side of that. Jack, how much uh, does a strong dollar play a role in this as well? The dollar, I think, is at at least two year highs right now. Yeah, I think it's certainly an important factor, uh, especially with manufacturing exports. Uh, but even there, um, a lot of that Midwest manufacturing, yes, it does go to other countries. A lot of it gets imported, too. So I think if you start netting it out, you're looking at maybe 5 percent of the total or something like that. Uh, so, no, I, I agree. I think this has more to do with the uncertainty surrounding policy. It wasn't, what, a month ago where President Trump ordered manufacturing companies to get out of China completely. So I think that there's still uh, rules of the road that need to be understood. And this is a process that, that's been optimized since the early 80s. So turning it around very quickly is going to take some time. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and to that point, I, I want to bring up uh, David Bonson. Uh, yesterday, a company called Bayou Steel has been in business, since, well, was in business since 1979. They shut down 376 employees let go. I thought it was interesting because the governor blames this on the tariffs. He says uh, that while the company didn't give any specific reason for the closure, uh, the, the used recycling scrap metal is largely imported and that it's, it's particularly vulnerable to tariffs. Now, Louisiana is a pure Trump state, uh, so maybe no political damage there. But certainly people are going to pick up on this kind of thing. It's not what was promised. Now, these are still tariffs that are a little bit different than, than the China tariffs. Uh, but the White House, you think, maybe start to hear a different message? Yeah, and I think that most in the White House, there's one particular person by the name of Pete Navarro, who I think is an exception. But I think most of the advisors in the White House do get this message. They do understand there's a lot on the line. Some things are direct about the impact of the tariffs to a particular industry, but some are more indirect. I think Jack was alluding to that. There's kind of this uh, business confidence that ends up getting affected around the uncertainty you see it in that uh, Louisiana data you talk about, but also the jobs data, which is so strong around the country, has actually been a little weak in some of those key Rust Belt states that the president really needs. David, stay here because I Thank need you. you in this next conversation as well. Elizabeth Warren, who thinks that the right answer is to break up the companies, um, you know, I mean, if she gets elected president, then I would, I would bet that we will have a legal challenge and I would bet that we will win the legal challenge. And um, so I... I does that still suck for us? Yeah. I mean, I don't have to, you know, have a major lawsuit against our own government. I mean, that's not like the position that you want to be in when you're, you know, I mean, it's like we, we care about our country and like want to work with our government to do good things. And, um, but, but look, at the end of the day, if someone's going to try to threaten something that existential, you go to the map and you fight. Uh, 
Folks, those are serious words. He wants to go to the mat. Now, you couple this with uh, some of these federal big tech antitrust probes, also state lawsuits. Uh, Silicon Valley obviously shaking in their boots. Joining us in this conversation, Fox News con uh, contributor DeRoy Murdoch, Democratic strategist David Brown. David Bonson is with us as well. David Brown, let me start with you. Uh, you know, all of this, to me, dovetails into Elizabeth Warren. She is a juggernaut. I've been saying that for six weeks. The key, the key uh, maybe topic for 2020 will be income inequality, the ultra wealthy having it all. And now Zuckerberg admitting that uh, he's somewhat worried. David Bonson, uh, last time you were here, before you left the studio, you mentioned you were working on a book about Elizabeth Warren. Uh, you know, you got to have a lot to write about, my man. It might hit the stance at the right time. I, again, I think she's a juggernaut. And, and here's the thing. I don't know that she's going to ever have to truly explain how she's going to pay for these things, that there just may be enough animosity toward ultra wealthy folks that gets her through. Oh, so you don't think that the liberal media will make her have to explain how she's going to pay for things? I, uh, I, I kind of share your cynicism, my friend. Uh, listen, I, I will say to my friends on the right and very thoughtful people that have concerns with the behavior of big tech Silicon Valley companies, the enemy of your enemy is not your friend in this case. You do not want to replace different things you're concerned about at Google or Facebook with Elizabeth Warren or with the federal behemoth bureaucracy. The fact of the matter is that there are legitimate concerns that need to be addressed. We already have a legal standard for what is a monopoly. There are legal requirements around privacy protection. I think the censorship issue that Roy brought up is a little more complicated. Elizabeth Warren's uh, uh, motives here are not the rights motives. Right. She's driven by class envy, and this is not going to end well if we decide to borrow her talking point. Well